Packers legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Welcome, 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 my friend, to the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, Brad Wilson, and today's guest is Party Poker Pro and current number seven GPI ranked player in the world, Kristen Bignell. Before we jump into Kristen and I's conversation, I wanted to take a second to remind you about EnhanceYourEdge.com slash resources. If you love what I do here with Chasing Poker Greatness and want to support the show, you can head to EnhanceYourEdge.com slash resources and click through any of the Coach Brad approved products and services that are listed there. Kristen Bicknell has over $5 million in live caches to go along with $3.7 million in online earnings, which is, as Larry David might say, pretty, 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 pretty good. There is a hand Kristen played recently that I stumbled across on Twitter that shows you why it's obvious she's one of the best in the world. With blinds at 15k, 30k, and a big blind ante of 30k, former Chasing Poker greatness guest Dara O'Kearney min raises from under the gun with pocket kings sitting on a 2.9 million chip stack. A loose passive recreational player that covers him flats on the button, Kristen sitting on a 1.38 million chip stack, comes along from the small blind and the big blind folds. With 240k in the middle, the flop is king 7 5 rainbow with one diamond. Kristen checks, Dara checks his top set. The wreck bets 115k. Kristen calls and Dara overcalls. The turn is the deuce of diamonds, putting up a backdoor flush draw, and with 585k in the pot, Kristen leads 220k into Dara and the wreck. Dara smooth calls once again with his top set and the wreck folds. The river is the seven of diamonds, completing the backdoor flush and pairing the board. Kristen bets 650k, leaving herself with only 350. Dara shoves, and Kristen folds, getting 6.5 to 1 on her money. She only needs to be right greater than 13% of the time in order to profitably call here. Her hand? Pocket fives for a full house. While I very much wish we could have had the opportunity to discuss her exact thought process in this hand, alas, I didn't know of its existence until we had finished recording. However, I'll give my thoughts and they're fairly simple. Dara is simply never bluffing here, and Kristen doesn't beat any of his value, which are King 7, Pocket Kings, and Quads. The best hands Kristen beats are Pocket Aces and Ace King, which are never shoving the river. And because Dara didn't see bet the flop, we can also heavily discount his backdoor diamond draws. And to be fair, he probably shouldn't be shoving ace queen of diamonds, even if that hand is in his range. So the next time you get annoyed that folks aren't folding enough in the games you play, try to at least be a little grateful that they aren't Kristen Bicknell, who's capable of correctly folding a full house, getting 6.5 to 1 on the river. In today's episode, you'll learn why Kristen hates selling her own action and would never want a full-time backer, why asking for help and being vulnerable takes you way farther in life than always trying to be a stone-cold killer, Kristen's thoughts playing the final day of the Shooting Star Classic, the last tournament before we were all sent to our rooms without a key, and much more. So get ready, strap in, and get prepared to hear from a human being with a poker mind like a diamond, Kristen Bicknell. Kristen, how are we doing? Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm doing good. Doing very well. Hanging out in Canada? Yes. Yeah. Um, kind of enjoying this break, actually. I think I've been home for, I guess, five weeks now or something without traveling, which I haven't been able to say for the past few years. I've been you know, traveling to tournament after tournament. And um, yeah, it's been a nice little break. And I'm lucky enough to have 
different sites to play on being in Canada. So poker online is kind of booming right now. Way to, way to rub that in my face. right? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome though. I, poker is booming. There are just traffic everywhere is way up. Sites are crashing left and right yeah. in the middle of tournaments. It's, uh, it's an interesting time. Yes. <laughs> I, want, I wanted to start out by asking you your story. How did you get involved playing cards in the first place? Sure. Um, when I was, I think, 17 or 18 years old, my first year of university, um, my roommates at the time... I knew nothing about poker and they came and said, do you guys want to play poker? We're having a little tournament tonight and they were having friends over and it was like, okay, sure. Never really actually, I don't think I was really interested that evening to even play. And then as soon as we started playing, I was hooked. I like fell in love with the game. We played all night until I guess noon the next day. And then me and that group of people, we started playing poker, I don't know, maybe three or four nights a week. And we got really competitive. Like the boys were fighting. And uh, yeah, I just fell in love with the game. And I guess from there, I started playing at local games. There was a little cash game like underground um, in the city that I went and played at. What was it about poker that made you fall in love with the game? It's a it's a good question that I'm not I can't really remember exactly what it was. I I guess it was, you know, 14 or 15 years ago now. So I'm trying to to what recall the feeling, the feeling, do you remember how you felt in that early time in your poker career when you were playing cards? I was just so excited and so I remember reading poker books and I don't remember who it was, but I remember listening to I don't forget if it was a podcast or it was like a coaching something. But I remember reading information about poker and just feeling like there was so much information to learn and like download in my brain and feeling really excited by it. I loved, you know, the aspect of of winning money. I'm not going to lie. You know, when you're a university student and you maybe have, you know, 500 bucks or something like that. And then, you know, playing a one-two game where I won, you know, maybe 1500 in one night or something like that. You know, the money was definitely a cool aspect to it. I think that I guess the competitive nature of it and like also that psychology behind it is really cool and and understanding that okay I just bluffed you this hand now what am I going to do this hand would I bluff you again that part of it's just really cool and there's just so many aspects of poker for sure it's uh I mean I I remember the best day monetarily that I had in life before poker I, I made like $250 working a Valentine's Day shift at Applebee's. And I thought I was like so happy, like on cloud Aww. nine. And then uh, saved up my money, started playing cards. And just kind of straight away, I ran very, very well. And was winning like 700 or 1200 like hit a high hand on the, the boat to nowhere for like an extra 500 And I'm like, oh man, this is... That's awesome. Uh, this is a thing. Like I... I I was very fortunate in that I ran very well, but I, I was like you as well. Like when I learned about poker, sitting at Applebee's, I would read Super System like 45 minutes before every shift and yep. after every shift. And I told everybody too, like, I'm going to be a professional poker player. Like I was, I had that conviction back in like 2004. People like, they just laughed in my face, right? And yep. I'm like, no, you don't understand. I'm going to make this work. Yep. And uh, somehow, Somehow it worked out. Yes. Um, yeah. It's awesome. How did you go from, you know, playing in these home games to being like a full time grinder? Like, what did that process look like? Kind of similar to your experience. I had times when people laughed in my face. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that the summer after I, the first un- summer after university where I had just learned the game. Um, I found a card room that I could play at being 18. I think I had to travel to the States to like one of these Indian reservation rooms. And actually it was there that I remember I had a poker book and I I wrote like the results in the poker book every day. I was tracking my results. And then when I went back to school, couldn't play live as much, found online poker and, you know, started playing tournaments when I could. And What what year was this? This was, I believe it must have been around 04, 05. And I graduated in 04. So yeah, I think, I think around then. And played online when I could, 
started playing more and more, you know, skipping more classes. I remember the first tournament I won, I was supposed to be a class, but I had read the tournament and then it was going really well and I missed <laughs> it. And it was like, whoa, I turned $11 into, I think it was maybe 12,000 or something at the time. And it was like incredible. And I was like, this is amazing. Like I, same thing that, that like drive just hit me. Like I can do this. I can be a professional poker player. And then I found out about Poker Stars Supernova Elite System that was happening. And I don't think I had any close, close friends that were doing it. But basically what it was is that you played eight hours a day for the entire year or something like that. But you put in a lot of volume and for each hand, um, just for people who don't know what it is, for each hand that you play, I'm assuming you do, um, you got points. And if you got enough points, you'd get... It's called Supernova Elite, where you could basically... By the end of the year, you'd have 130k or something put in your pocket. So I was making. So, anyways, I set out the challenge to do this, where you know I ended up playing one two and two four. I think I started at fifty cent a dollar, and you know I'm making a hundred thousand dollars in one year just by sitting there for eight hours a day playing honestly really tight nitty bad poker. But I did it, and a lot of people, I guess, struggled with the work ethic aspect of it, and you know putting in the long hours and you know, the grind of it, but I loved it. I, every day I was excited to play. I had my VP, like my point goal for the day and I'd wake up and be like, okay, you know, need to play eight hours, get this many points per hour. And I loved it. And so from there, um, I did that program for a few years. And then one thing kind of led to another, you know, played in cash games that opened doors where I met people who said, Hey, why don't you play this tournament or things like that? And it was like, okay, let's, you know, play a tournament you know, the World Series of Poker was always fun and going to Vegas was fun. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to, like you said, like at the beginning, I definitely ran well in my poker career, I think. That first year when you were, or when you were going for Supernova Elite, were you breaking even? Were you turning a profit like on a monthly basis? Because like, don't you realize all the money like right at the end when you make Supernova Elite? Yeah, you get a lot of money at the end, but you'd get a lot of money towards the end of each month. So. I think the first year I lost, it was kind of a minor amount. I think I lost eight or 10K on the tables. So I ended up profiting like 120K or something like that. The second year I did win. And then I think the third year I did it, I lost a little bit as well. But each month you would make a certain amount. So as soon as you'd hit a certain target, you could get, you could trade in your points for like a 10K bonus. I definitely had some, some challenges within that. Um, that maybe we could talk about later, you know, at, at times when I didn't clear my bonus and my, I had to play 24 tables to do this. So I was 24 tabling for eight hours a day. And there was one point where I remember I had auto rebuy on and it was like, you don't have enough funds to rebuy. And I was like, oh my God. Like it was just one of those like really huge downswings. I was 70% of the way. It was in September. And I was you know, felt it was probably one of the the key moments that sticks out in my head is like, you know, the the bottom of my poker career. Um, What'd you do? So I was lucky. I had um, a friend who sent me, you know, a few thousand dollars or whatever it was in order for me to kind of play through it, get the bonus. And then once I got the bonus, I paid him back. But I mean, to I was probably 20 years old or something. It wasn't easy. You know, right now I might be in a spot where it's easy to get someone to loan me like 5k if I needed or something like that. But then it wasn't like that was a lot of money to us still. And, you know, I started out this challenge on I think I had a 10k or 8k bankroll. And I was playing 50 cent a dollar. So I had moved up to one two. And I think a lot of buy ins, actually. Yeah, it is. So so yeah, to play 24 tables of one two, um, the amount that you need in your account, right, is, is kind of yeah, it's substantial. 20, 2400 plus you're reloading all the time and exactly going on downswings and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um playing super nitty those 24 tables was that so was that your default style back then or were you just because I know it like for for me at least at some point there's diminishing returns in how many tables I play and for me the number is typically like 6. Yep. Um, if I, I've tried to go to like 10 or 12 and I feel like I'm just playing catch up, I'm not, I'm not yep. seeing the things that I, that I normally see that give me an edge. So were you dumbing down your game in order to play all of these tables? I think I, yeah, I think I had to have been, I think that I probably didn't know nearly as much as I know now with poker. So to me, it was probably somewhat of a, 
you know, autopiloting, I'll just, you know, wait for the top 12% of hands kind of thing. Uh, You also got points for every hand that you folded. So I kind of was (laughs) aware that all I needed to do was really get the volume in and to get these hands in. Yeah. That's an interesting thing. You get, you got rewarded for hands that you folded. Yeah, it was crazy. So eventually they changed the system. And that's when people started, you know, going on outrage because they realized a lot of people were kind of like exploiting the system of this. Like all of us were playing nine max. And I think, you know, if you saw someone that V pipped more than like 18%, they're crazy. It was, (laughs) there were so many of us. There's people who short stacked it too. And, you know, they literally played like 12, eight, something like that. Like it was crazy. Uh, I remember the short stackers playing ultra, ultra nitty. Yeah. I know that it, at, on UB, there was a guy who was playing like 12 hours a day, 12 tables a day, who was 100% a bot. Like were bots an issue yeah. on stars back then? Do you That's remember? A good question. I think that there was definitely implications of that. And I know that I've gotten refunds, you know, them saying that there's been, you know, whatever faulty play or whatever it is. But I feel like the sites aren't, they don't want to release that information if they don't need to necessarily. So I, I, yeah, I think there was definitely accusations and I definitely got refunds. So, which is interesting. I like there, they, there should be transparency to the players. Like the the more transparent, the better, in my opinion. Yep. The is kind of a funny story, little tangent, The, the bot that I was playing against, he got caught because he won the thing. The thing about the bots is like this guy was, he's a losing player, right? Like the bot was losing like maybe half a big blind per hundred or something very small, making it up in rake back, but also crushing any sort of promotion every month. Right. Yeah. Like just, just like winning the free seeds, the leaderboards, yeah. Winning the leaderboards, just crushing all the promotions. And he actually won a seat to like a 10 K and his stupid little bot was playing was 12 tabling while he was playing in the 10 K and like, this is how kind of wow. like wild Westy it was back then. I told my VIP host, like I, back then we had VIP hosts. I, I just called Victor on the phone on ultimate bet. I'm like, Hey, Victor, this guy. And he's like, no, no, no. I've met this guy in real life. Or I've met this guy oh. on the phone. He's a real person. He's not a bot. And I'm like, no, like, <laughs> like someone's behind the bot. Yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. not an actual robot gone rogue. Playing yes. <laughs> Right? Like, yeah, that would be funny. If that it. is the bot, right? And wow. I, I don't think anything was done. I think they just like kept letting him. It's crazy, yeah. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's it, it. Was interesting how it was back in the day. Yep. So you know, you are doing well. You're running well early on in your career. What would you think is like the first breakthrough that really, you know, made you say, "I'm going to be elite. I'm going to sure. be world class in this game." The the first breakthrough with that, I think, was honestly, um, I felt for many years that I was just kind of making enough to get by and maybe a little bit extra. And so never really building much of a bankroll, never really had huge connections in poker, you know, people who were playing at a higher level that I was friendly with or anything like that. And I can't remember exactly what year it was, but there was a summer where I spent more time in Vegas um, for the summer and started meeting people and having friends who were playing higher than me. And, you know, without a doubt, having um, not necessarily only their encouragement, but opening the door of like, you know, I remember the first time that people offered to buy my action in the World Series main event. And it was like, such a sigh of relief because I think for four years before that, it was like my dream to play the main event and I never did. And I went to Vegas and I played satellites and even to be familiar, I wasn't even aware of the selling action thing. You know, I was a cash game player. I didn't really understand that people did that with tournaments. I knew there was backers and things like that, you know, but quite honestly, I was like a nobody in poker. So who was, you know, people hadn't heard of me. I didn't really have those connections, that kind of thing. Um, And then I remember playing cash games and meeting somebody who, said to me, like, you're not playing the main event. Like, what are you doing? Like, I'll buy a piece. My friends will buy a piece. Like, let's get you in there. And it was like, oh my God, it it, it was really just like a, an incredible, I guess, moment and eye-opening experience of, well, wow, like maybe there's so much more potential for me to explore. And so I remember playing in that. And then I think that same summer also... Um, 
doing well with cash games. I'm trying to think exactly. So there, there was that moment of sort of, you know, I got to play the, the World Series of Poker main event and that it made me a little bit more confident in, you know, the next World Series to go and sell action and seeing that as, you know, an option. At the same time, I started moving up in stakes and cash games. And I remember one huge breakthrough for sure is when I made the jump from 2.5 to 5.10. And as you know, as a cash game player, it's a pretty big jump, you know, financially. um, The games are quite different. It's funny. I would actually say 5.10 is softer than 2.5 in its own way. Because so like this interesting thing happens in poker where there's barriers to entry at each stake. And for lots of people, uh, they don't have enough money to play 5.10. They're not rolled for it. So they stick with 2.5, the grinders, they grind out. Because you can make you know $40 an hour yep. if you're one of the better players at 2.5. So you get kind of lackadaisical and you stay at 2.5, just grinding out your $40. But then the players that just, you know, any recreational player with disposable income that wants to play 5.10, like it's like, yeah, it's always interesting to me how like, there are times where I'm playing like 2040 no limit in games that are like a million times better than like the two five game across the room. Right. Absolutely. And that was, that was a huge eye opening experience because to me, I always thought, you know, five ten online was really tough and he probably still is. But, um, I remember not necessarily being intimidated to go play five ten live, but just thinking, you know, that it, you know, I didn't have the bankroll for it. And one thing in poker that I always have felt strong about is that I wanted to have my own bankroll. I didn't want to be backed. So for many years, because I was a little bit stubborn with that, I think even, even though it worked out for me, I, I kind of, I feel like I kept myself at that two, five grinding stage, you know, you're making $40 an hour, but you're not really building a bankroll to then move up stakes. You're right. kind of getting by. And so I was stuck in that. And anyways, uh, I don't, remember exactly how it came about, but I remember having a summer where I grinded 510 Bellagio like every day, eight, sometimes 20, 30 hours a a session um, and doing really, really well. I think I was averaging like over, I don't know, $110 an hour or something. Which is real good. Yeah. And it felt, it felt great because I was at a point in that summer, I also happened to bink a tournament for a lot of money, which was, you know, which was great. And then I came, went from the spot where I was like, great, now I have a bankroll to really work with. You know, I, I, so I really turned the corner from, you know, having a bankroll that was only used to kind of pay bills and, you know, sit at these smaller games to now I had a bankroll that I had more maneuver room. I could play one K tournaments and things like that. Like you need a big bankroll to go play live tournaments or you need some power to, you know, sell action or whatever it might be. So yeah, that was definitely one of my one of my really big points that opened what it really did was open the door for me because then along the way I made, you know, more connections which again just sort of opened my eyes to oh, I can play a 10k and only take 20% of myself. I didn't know I could do that. Things right. like that things like that. I you know, to me it just seemed like you know, playing 10k's live was um an option that I would have never had. To um, and then I realized, oh, it's actually doable. So I'm a cash player. I don't play a ton of MTTs. Sure. Is this pretty normal to sell action, but not specifically have a backer in the MTT world? And uh, I guess you're, you're, as far as cash game goes and everything like that, you're still own rolled and on your own. Yeah. And it's the same like with tournaments. I always try to be, to be honest. I don't like the idea of selling action. I don't like the idea of having a backer. I... I think I like to be in charge <laughs> in one way. Um, I think that I think it can be a dangerous trap of, you know, if I think I'm profitable in a game, I want 100% of those profits. I don't want to then give some guy, you know, 50% when he's done nothing except put money up. If I can get a way to put that money up myself, I want to keep all those profits. I have noticed myself you know, I only sell action once in a while for really high stuff right now. And I always feel bad. Like if it doesn't go well, I feel I don't want to lose someone else's money. If I'm going to lose, I want to lose my own money. I know that that might seem counterintuitive for a lot of people, but I think it puts a pressure that I don't really like. Um, yeah, for sure it does. And uh, in my conversation with Ari Engel on this show, 
he talked about how like he's been back three times, three or four times, and the, his backers always dropped him every single time. Oh. And it's like after every tournament, he feels compelled to like tell his backer how he busted. Yes, yeah. tell his backer like if he made a bad play, he he would feel compelled to tell him like the worst play that he made. And um, you know, for people that don't really understand poker, yes, there are backers who you know. Th- a lot of times they're businessmen or you know people who are in business that are looking for an opportunity to make some money they don't understand the variance yeah and they all they don't understand that like part of the reason that Ari's great is his punt right like it's this ability yeah. to do some things that maybe not everybody understands but feel right in the moment yeah um but and won't hard, always work and won't that's always okay. work yeah. right but yeah. it's hard to justify to somebody else when you're playing with their money. Absolutely. Just a weird, weird dynamic. Thing. Yeah. I have one person who I've sold action to. And if he's listening, I, I'm happy to say this because I'll say it to his face. But he is a recreational poker player. He, you know, he is wealthy. So he, anyways, he was buying pieces and I go to like collect money that I've lost. And he literally makes me feel bad. He's like, you lose everything. And like literally guilt tripping me. I was like, is this real? Like how like he's a poker player too. Like he understands this, but he's like guilt tripping me that I've lost in, in four tournaments or something. Right. And so now I'm like, I don't want to sell action to people like that ever again. You Which know, is the expectation, right? Like you're supposed yes. to lose four tournaments in a row all the time. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's a big thing. But anyways. Yeah. They need managers. They just need, I'll, I'll manage the money. You guys just stay away. Yes. <laughs> I'll deal with all the people that you invest in. Exactly. Leave them alone and let them do the thing that makes them great. That makes yep. them, you know, a favorite in all the fields, right? Exactly. Like, we're human beings. We're fallible. Everybody yep. makes mistakes, but like the great players, they learn from their mistakes. And they're yes. also, you know, if somebody does something that's unconventional, that in their mind generates an edge or is an exploitative thing over the field, then of course it's going to be different than what everybody else does, right? Because yes. that's what makes them in the upper echelon of poker players. Absolutely. Yep. So, okay. <laughs> go, go back to your story. <laughs> yes. Um, so you're doing well. You, you have a great year at the WSOP. You start playing the 10Ks. What was like, what year was that, that you had that breakthrough WSOP? Yeah, that's a good, uh, 2000, it was when I won that bounty event. I won a bracelet. Um, I think it was 2015. That sounds about right to me. It might've been 16. Wow. So that's, that's only five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so for, you know, for many, many years, I was just grinding it out you know, grinding out one, two, two, four online, low stakes MTTs. And, you know, probably never really had a bankroll more than, you know, 40 K something like that. And winning that event, uh, which I had sold action to as well. I think I won, I don't know, 300 K or something like that. So I think I pocketed maybe like 150 K from that or more, but it was a nice bankroll to work with. And it gave me the tournament bug. (laughs) Right. That's, so that kind of shifted my perspective. And this is all after um, Black Friday. So online poker wasn't as, you know, thriving as much and especially cash games online. So I kind of... They're still not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, I was a poker stars cash game player and no longer after then. And yeah, from there, you know, I get the tournament bug and start slowly transitioning from being a cash game player to a tournament player. If you had to do it again in those 10 years that you were grinding with like the, the 40 K bankroll, never really making any breakthroughs or progress, what would you do differently? I think I would have reached out for more support to get in bigger games earlier. I think I, what do you mean by support? Um, I think either, you know, borrowing money from people or selling pieces, maybe being a little bit more motivated to go play in higher games um, and then say selling a percent, you know, if I, not waiting until I had the bankroll to play 510 on my own to go play it. Uh, Later, later on, I started playing in cash games where I would then sell pieces. But I remember just not really seeing it as an option or not knowing how to go about that. And I wish I would have had the confidence to do that because I definitely had the confidence to play in the games. I've never struggled with that. And I've never had, 
you know, an issue playing high stakes, like the money thing. I, I don't know what it is about me, but for some reason, I don't really have fears around that. But I definitely had fears of asking for help and not really... Want, I still, to this day, hate selling action. I hate asking for help. I, I don't know what it is. I just really hate that. And I wish I would have moved up earlier. Yeah, that, that would probably be one thing for sure. Yeah, I think a lot of folks don't realize that once you're an established player and once you have a network, it's pretty much impossible to go broke unless you are like a scumbag who just has stolen from a bunch of people and you've ruined your reputation, period. Because a great poker player who goes broke, all the people in their network see that as an opportunity to invest yes. to invest in someone. So like, you know, I think that folks that get stuck at 40, 50K... Um, bankroll or are scared of moving up, scared of taking a shot. If you have a network, you can afford to take more shots because, yes. you know, with one text or one phone call, like I know for sure that I could, well, I can't get in any <laughs> big live, live game right now, but like I could get in a bunch of live games, just sending texts to my network. And, and exactly. so it's just such a big deal building that. Yes. Yeah. And not, and not having any shame around that. I think that, you know, there's a lot of emotions that can come up for some people asking for help or, you know, um, I've even had the experience recently where, you know, I might've, I was playing 10 Ks on my own and then I go to the spot where I need to start selling action again. And it kind of feels like, oh, I'm moving backwards and this sucks. But I think, you know, as, as I've been in poker for many years, you have those ups and downs and you have the times when it goes down and maybe you need some, you know, assistance in, in continuing to do that. But, um, yeah, I think just having the confidence to, to rely on that support system and understanding that it's normal and natural of, uh, you know, as a part of the game. Yeah. It's ebbs and flows. Look at a graph. Graphs go up and graphs go down and that's just the nature of the beast. Exactly. Uh, Speaking of, so you did pretty well at the Bay 101. Is it the shooting star main? Yes. That experience because I read, an article that Matt Savage just wrote and it seemed like a pretty crazy ordeal. It was crazy. Yeah. It, um, definitely a tournament I'm never going to forget. That's for sure. Because, you know, all the circumstances around it. So this was, I'm trying to think the exact date. Is it May? Um, May. Yeah. So we, you know, we start hearing about this virus in January and I remember being in Australia and, and kind of, reading some conspiracy theories, reading some predictions and kind of understanding there's a really good chance this is going to be a really bad situation for the world. But, you know, just trying not to panic or do anything. And America especially wasn't panicked at all. You know, you (laughs) saw... To put it it lightly, they were not panicked. Yes. Now, in other countries, you know, even in Australia where I was we were definitely getting headlines and understanding. And even, I don't know if it's the people I follow on Twitter necessarily or who my boyfriend follows on Twitter, but we were definitely started at least educating myself and reading news enough to see that this was like serious. But, you know, I didn't cancel any poker trips or anything like that. And as Matt's article said from LAPC, which was right before Bay 101, everything just started in you know, the panic started increasing so much every day that it went from like, nothing was a problem to, oh my God, the casino is going to shut down. And people were like pretty much having anxiety attacks in like two weeks or something. Yeah. It was, uh, I think Timex had a post, he gave like 20 to one that the WSOP would not be canceled. And then two weeks later it was like break even. And he's like, Oh God, <laughs> like it's things crazy. change very, I, very quickly. I did not think that that was going to be a possibility. And now it's looking like, you know, who knows when we'll have live poker again. I have Honestly, no, I have it no will idea. be a while. Yeah. Because it will be a gathering of large people. So anyways, um, you know, I think it was day two of the event when the NBA closed down and um, you had all these announcements, you know, the tournament was underway. I think Matt had said they started they tried to speed up the levels or taking out some levels to make the tournament um, be done with quicker. But then when we get back on day three, which was the final day with, I think, 10 players left, one of the players had a mask on sitting in the corner and I guess he had some symptoms and wasn't feeling well and wanted everybody to know. And at that point, you know, it just becomes this 
sort you of really wanted to play right from that article. I remember he said that you were you were yeah. one of the people that wanted. I I did want to I did want to play. I still don't necessarily regret my perspective on the situation, even looking backwards and understanding that maybe at the time I didn't realize how serious the situation is. However, I've never been in a casino that was like so incredibly clean, so uh, almost hyper paranoid about everything. Like the rails were being sanitized during every break. You know, everyone has hand sanitizer. Everyone's doing all this stuff. And it was pretty empty. And at that point with 10 players left, I personally felt like, you know, we've been exposed to this guy. If he has it, we've been exposed to him, you know, for the last three or four days. People are typically contagious. You know, there's an incubation period. So if he has this, he would have been contagious yesterday as well. Right. Um, You know, I kind of, I believe in being cautious and, you know, making logical decisions, but I don't necessarily think we need to be panicked to leave six hours earlier. I don't know what that six hours of playing in a spot where, um, of course, that player should leave and we don't need to be around him, but we could all be careful and play out the tournament in six hours, I think. Uh, Maybe. But this was my opinion. I also came from a spot where, you know, I had a... uh, I mean, for one thing, as a tournament player, you... For myself, I live for those moments. Like, you know, money is one aspect of playing poker, but if you're playing tournament poker, like it is so fun to make a final table that just the pure enjoyment of that, you know, that's when that's what we prepare for and hope for. And it's so rare that you make a final table. So of course I was excited to make to be in that spot, you know, for the financial spot and just the enjoyment of it. Um, so I thought that it was a little panicky to just decide to leave when we were so close to being done anyway. Yeah. That was that was my opinion. I understand that it might be a little bit naive or uneducated and you know probably being more conservative is better. But well again this was like a month ago. <laughs> yes. A month ago and things have definitely changed like within the 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 last month. So there's some context to be had. Yes. And like you said, you know, you're you're a competitor, you're a battler. And yeah. people that play, uh, Bay 101 is a 5K, right? They play play these big mains. Obviously, it's a WPT stop. You get to go be on TV. Um, yeah. It's a big deal, right? Like, it's yeah. a big deal for your career. And then also the excitement of, like, leveling up every time somebody busts. That whole experience yeah. is just super fun. And, like, really, that's why... I mean, I don't play tournaments personally. I have. Yeah. Um, and I've made final tables. And, like that's it, right? Like this, this is the, the fruit of the labor. (laughs) Everything else is the labor. Exactly. Exactly. It's yeah. So in hindsight, you know, if maybe if America would have taken it a little bit more seriously, if, you know, if there was more awareness of it, you know, all those events should have been canceled to begin with, but it wasn't, it started. And at this point we've already played for, you know, whatever, over 20 hours or something like that. Right. Yeah, it was uh, it definitely things. Things could have been handled better from the people yes. in charge of handling things. I guess Absolutely. I'll, I can, but, <laughs> leave but yeah, it there. crazy experience of my life, and interesting that you know it was probably one of the last live tournaments for who knows how long. So we'll see. For for sure, have they even yeah. played the LAPC main final table yet? I don't think so, and I'm not sure if all that stuff's being delayed or canceled or what they're doing but it's like in purgatory right now waiting yeah. waiting to see if they can ever get to play it out again yeah it's kind of crazy when you think of joy in your career playing cards what's the first memory that comes to mind well i remember one of the first things that got me going in poker again on a very minor scale i played the three dollar rebuy to this to get a sunday million ticket that was on saturday got through and then on Sunday, played the Sunday Million and finished seventh place or something like that. And I rem- I was at my parents' house and I was trying to explain to my dad. I was like, oh my God, I won this seat to this tournament. And I was like, this tournament is, I, I think it was like, I don't know. It was pretty big to win back then. This is when I first started. I can't remember what first place was. But I was trying to explain to him, like, I could actually win this much money in this tournament. And him being really skeptical, like, is this real money? Or like, they're not going to let you cash this out. Or no, it's not real. It's not real. And I can't remember exactly what I cashed for. I think around 20,000 or something. And I remember getting 
ordering a check and then the check coming in the mail. And yeah, I mean, that has to be one of the best experiences, I think, is of just joy of those checks coming in the mail, the physical checks when, you know, you've never had more than whatever, you know, a couple thousand dollars in your hands. And all of a sudden, like, you know, online poker can sometimes feel like a game and you're clicking buttons and then you're seeing it in real life. And, you know, I just, those were to me some of the best moments of, you know, just getting started and thinking, oh, can I just win enough to, you know, I remember I wanted like a dining room set for my my dining room or things like that. And achieving those small little goals at the start were incredibly fulfilling. And shockingly enough, which still surprises me is that any achievement I have now doesn't even compare. And that's even like, you know, winning a few hundred thousand dollars. It, it It's a different level for sure. And it certainly feels good. But those smaller moments definitely had more of a just pure joy, whereas now it, it might be more of a feeling of relief, I think. Right. Yeah. It and then the other, yeah, the other I, thing that came to mind is just, you know, stacking. When I sit at a table, like being a female, I feel always underestimated. And when I could tell that there was a guy who kind of had an ego war with me or that really felt, if I felt he underestimated me, underestimated <laughs> me or um, you know was kind of targeting me at the table like especially at the beginning of my career but stacking those guys <laughs> feels really good oh i i believe it yes it feels, like <laughs> those are the best people to stack um, yes there are some people that i've played with there is one odd guy and this uh i was playing cards with bruno mars and there was a weird guy who was like moving up in stakes just to sit at the table with him and was like being ultra creepy, like ultra oh, weird. God. Had like a napkin where he like wrote a song and was like trying to get get him to like look at it. And like, he's like, no, I can't. I'm not going to take that thing. Like, you know, you could sue me and all like in the future, oh blah, blah, blah. And yeah. I remember like I had aces and the dude is playing like ultra nitty, like just ultra, ultra nitty. And he's got like 7K and I had him covered. And um, we just get into a raising war. And he ships it. I snap. Um, he has kings, and he's like once or th- he's like two times. Want to do two times? I'm like, no, buddy. <laughs> We're going one time for it all. And I busted him, and then he disappeared. That was a that was a good good pot. Yeah, that's awesome. It's weird because a lot of these people who are unpleasant, who are not fun to play with, who are antagonistic, who treat people poorly they are the whales at the table, right? Like we've had this conversation many times. And so I think this is why they've been able to get away with how they act for so long. That's true. Over the years, do you think it's changed? Uh, Well, obviously you, I guess people recognize you now, right? Like you're uh, a quote unquote, a name in poker. Sure. Do you get treated? Do people underestimate you? Well, I think for one thing that I've noticed, um, which is kind of a shame because obviously the lower limits are going to be an entry point for people into poker. But I definitely noticed that the higher I play, the more respect respectful the atmosphere is. Yep. You know, if I go sit in a one-two table, there's, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm sure that if I went today, I'd be disrespected. I 100%. mean, hundred percent. There's yeah. no doubt they're the worst. Like those one, two tables are just horrible. And I swear I'm like the nicest person, especially to play poker. Like I, I don't, I'm not super competitive versus people in nature. Like I, I'm competitive with myself, but I don't sit. Oftentimes I feel bad stacking people. So when I say that it feels good stacking someone, it means that they've been, they've been really uh, asking for it (laughs) or Because, you know, anyone just sitting down, if they're neutral, I'm not going to feel like, oh, I want to get this guy. Um, That's definitely not my nature. But anyways, yeah, I think as you move up limits, it becomes the atmosphere is better. I'm not sure if it's changed over the years because I've changed the games that I've played a little bit. But um, how do you reconcile that feeling bad about stacking people when you're literally paid to stack people? It's so hard. I struggle with it so much. Like even. I'm constantly struggling with that because I'm friendly and then I'll, you know, feel like I, someone's like my new friend or my friend. And I'm like, Oh my God. I'm like, this is a really good three bet spot. And I'm like, I I just have to do it. I think what you just have to do is 
I try to really understand that like, first of all, nobody wants you to like take it easy on them. You know, even if I sit at a table and someone's like, oh, I'm a fan or something like that, that becomes hard too. I'm like, oh no, <laughs> like, you know, I can tell this person's not that experienced. And now they're, they're really nice to me. I, I don't want to bluff them, but just realizing that I don't think anyone wants you to not play your game versus them anyways. And just trying to also show that, you know, that's the nature of poker is to be competitive and to be tough to play against. And, you know, that no one should take it personally. It's, it's quite funny. And, just makes me want to share this, that in ladies events, I actually feel like for whatever reason, that's been the form of poker where it's been like the cattiest that I've been at or that people, you know, get offended that you tried bluffing them or something like that. And it's like, that's not poker. You know, we just need to play. And I I don't know. I I think just trying to understand I'm there to, you know, play my game, make money and, and to be a challenge. So if I think that, you know, by not three betting this guy who's really nice and not very good at poker, it's like I'm not really doing him a service by just folding. <laughs> you know, he I, he needs to up his game. Right. I mean, yeah. everybody knows what the deal is, right? When we sit down, we're yeah. involved in a competition. You don't have to be an asshole to somebody, right? When you're yeah. a, as you're check raising them with an air ball, but like yeah. you know that you're there to compete, you're there to play. You don't have to rub it in anybody's face or make anybody feel bad. But like, yeah, you are there to play hard. I mean, that's yeah, that, that's the gig. Exactly. Um, you know, like NFL football players. As soon as the game's over, they shake hands, they hug each other, they talk. Yes. Like there's this yeah. respect shown to one another through competition. Yes, exactly. When you think about pain in your poker career, what's the first memory that comes to mind? I think, as I was saying before, that moment, you know, I was doing Supernova Elite, grinding. So I have this target of points to get from January to December. And we're in September and the year has gone quite well. And then I think I just had a disastrous month where, you know, I'm not able to then sit on all my tables because my balance in, in my PokerStars account was too low. And I think that was a really painful experience that ended up actually being quite a beautiful learning experience for me for many reasons, but especially because, you know, the first person I shared this with was willing to instantly help me. And I think sometimes it's easy when you're struggling in life, like wherever it might be in poker and, you know, anything, um, seeing like, like it kind of sounds cheesy, but even right now, you know, with this stuff going on in the world and seeing how many people are so willing to help other people, it's quite beautiful. And I just had a moment of understanding, like, you know, it's not all on me. Like, it's okay. It's okay to receive help. It's okay to ask for help. And um, so it ended up being, you know, one of those times in life where you're, you're in a lot of pain, but it ends up being like a beautiful learning lesson at the end. Um, but I think more than anything, you know, the the pain of being in a big tournament spot and it going badly when you know that, you know, if you're in the tournament poker world, especially the live circuit, there's finishing first in a tournament gets people are just so results oriented that there really is so much value in, you know, um, winning your first high roller that you play or something like that. And knowing that not just for that one tournament, it's important to win, but like the, the benefits that come and getting unlucky in those spots really has hurt and, and does hurt. So, you know, unfortunately, any specific ones come to your mind? Sure. Um, well, when I, I was just talking about this the other day, but it was one of my first 25 K's that I, it's the first 25 K I final tabled. Um, it was the party poker Barcelona stop. And one clip that gets aired a lot is I actually like made a really crazy fold to Adrian Mateos. And I, I've wrote a blog piece about that fold. Um, so I felt like I played very well at the final table. But unfortunately, I got Jackson versus Reiner Kempe's 10s for all the chips with, I think, like seven left or eight left. And he had a 10. And it was just one of those spots that I think was kind of like could have been a an interesting breakthrough moment for me because I was kind of new to especially like playing high rollers. 
And yeah, to be in that spot that was seemingly, you know, it was like a million dollars for first. And what we were talking about is the payouts were so flat. So I think I maybe made like five buy-ins or something versus, yeah, a huge payout. And just what we were saying before is the credibility, you know, that, that a first place can get. People are all of a sudden more excited to buy your action. People respect you more. You know, unfortunately, that isn't necessarily um, doesn't necessarily show that much of a skill. You know, differentiation. It, I, I do think that when people win tournaments, it's like an invaluable experience that really you're more likely to win one again and feel confident on a final table. But, anyways, that's one one that comes to mind. Yeah, I know. Like back in the day, in the in the boom when the WPT was just kicking off, like Antonio Sfondiari, like he wins a 10K. And I think to myself, these people that ran really well in these 10Ks right at the boom yeah. ran better than anybody else just in life, in the world. Because being a, you know, a WPT champion meant so much back then just for the benefits outside of poker, right? Absolutely. Just, you get sponsorships, you get all of this, these other... Um, opportunities to invest in full tilt poker to be a, be a part of it. it's just like it's worth so much more than simply yep. the first million dollars which is obviously a, a shitload of money right i'm not yeah. discounting that but like over the lifetime of career it's worth many multiples of, yep. of that money absolutely and yeah i just you know I, I went through many years of kind of you know on different levels struggling like that to get that respect or to get those finishes that you know if i would have won one of my first tournaments that i played you know this was back when poker stars was giving sponsorships out to everybody and it was a much different landscape um i think you know probably people would have known about me years before but i just never really got that opportunity Right. I mean, not many people do, right? Yeah. Not, not many people win the tournament. I mean, exactly. When I played sit and goes on party poker, I know specifically there were times where I'd play 25 200s and not win any of them. And I would think to myself, like, wow, multi table tournament players have to deal with this. <laughs> like, they can make 25 final tables and not win one. Like, yeah. it's just brutal. There's no more pain in poker than tournament poker, honestly. It's like, it's crazy. There's so many times that I contemplate, should I just go back to cash games? Because this is crazy. Anytime that I've considered uh, transitioning and playing more tournaments, I think back to, I was playing Owen Crow at Commerce um, in LA in cash game. And he's just like, man, tournament players, like... He was getting staked, I think, and he's in a stable and he's like, they're just all miserable. (laughs) They're just all miserable human beings. Like playing in cash games is so much better. Everybody's having fun. Like it's a light atmosphere. Tournaments are just heart wrenching. They are. And it's tense and like, yeah. And those guys too, you know, you get stuck 90K, 100K in makeup and then you bink a tournament for like 110 and then your backer just snap drops you. It's It's like... Oh my God. That's the experience I don't want to be in. (laughs) Yeah. Right. For sure. And I do want to bring up one thing and we can edit this out if you're not comfortable talking about it, but I know like as far as getting credibility, all of these things, there was that one tournament, Doug Polk makes a video, right? Of you and Alex obviously making final three, which is a thing that's going to happen eventually, as long as you're playing in the same tournaments, going through that hand. I mean, I, I watched it. One thing that I, that I thought got completely that was just completely missing was like your reaction as soon as Alex bet the river was like, Oh, like you have Kings. I was like, like as a poker player, I was like, wow, that's a fucking great read. Like it was just like instantaneously you knew, right? Yeah. And nobody talked about that of course, because of the weird dynamic that was going on. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm fine to talk about this. And um, we actually just talked about this recently too. And it, it, that's one thing also in my reaction that wasn't talked about is how, uncomfortable situation it was for me and Alex and how like in that moment uh I was just like what is happening and like oh my god and at that moment I didn't think at all that there was any like accusations or that anything looked weird it wasn't until I fold and then Kale asked me wow you had aces and I'm like yeah and I was thinking like oh my god I made a great fold and then I realized like oh he's thinking that we're doing something like we're up to no good, which I would never do. Like we're on a stream. So when you're like innocent in your mind, I was just thinking like, oh my God, what a tough spot, you know? And, and the reason it was such a tough spot was, you know, Kale 
Kale's stack was so small. If I, I was thinking on the river, I'm like, if I call here, like I'm going to be the shortest stack. And, you know, I didn't have a ton of tournament experience at that time. And, you know, me and Alex talk poker all the time too. And I kind of, I don't know, tended to think that like it was hard to find bluffs for him, whatever it was. But, um, and now I forget the initial question about that. It was just about dealing with yeah. the, uh, all the outrage, I guess, that yeah. came Hell's way. Oh, with the credibility and stuff. Yeah, I think that people who know me personally and know Alex personally um, know that, you know, for one thing, that like neither of us would ever try to take advantage of that situation, like for many reasons. You offered a chop, right? You offered yeah. an equity chop with a guy and he declined it. Various times, too. And that, yeah, so for one thing, like just that if you knew us as people that we would never really like look for that. And I think a lot of the outrage was definitely, I think, from people who don't know us or kind of understand the situation. And even in that, it's like, I kind of hated the criticism of, oh, you folded a hand, you can't fold or something like that. I was just talking to someone earlier today where I made a crazy fold. We were talking about it to um, uh, Dara from the chip race. And I mean, if, if I think someone's not bluffing, I'm not going to call off my chips because I have a really good hand. Like, right. oh, because I, mean, I have the top of my range. Like, I just don't subscribe to that. Sure. And, and you can <laughs> tell, like, w- watching the video, because yeah. I, I did watch the Doug Polk video. I watched the live footage because I was just trying to get a sense of it. And I, I'm yeah. not a tournament player, but you could tell your reaction straight away. As soon as he bet the river, it was like instantly expletive, and you, you just knew, right? You're, yeah. You just knew the situation. You yeah. knew that he's, he just got it. He's not very mess- unlikely to bluff. Yeah. He's not messing around. Right? Yeah. But yeah, I, I did want to ask about that. Yeah. So I think for that, it didn't really change too much. What it did change that I'm kind of, um, what bothers me the most is that there's definitely some players who I feel like now watch us with a microscope and it kind of is always awkward to play with him now because there's it's like even you know say I want to check in a spot I'm like oh no like is that gonna look weird if I check and need to bet and like I think the same thing like if I want to fold in a spot I feel like oh maybe I can't fold this because that's you know could look bad or something like that so I, I hate having to play under that filter even though I know that you know we're competing versus each other and you know it, it's not necessarily that I want to, but we play the certain same tournament. So it ha- you know, we have to. Right. And that's a yeah. crappy mindset issue to have to deal with wondering about how something looks if, yes. and going against your instincts to do something just so that nothing quote unquote looks shady. Right. Like exactly. It's a, it's a crappy dynamic to have to go through. I think yeah. when I was, I mean, I don't know, <laughs> maybe it's different when I, like when I'm battling my friends, I'm actually, I always felt incentivized to crush them. <laughs> like, a lot of people feel that, yeah. Like uh, we would go hard at each other. And again, going back to what you said about the ladies event, like we're, we both understand, you know, me and my friends, we understand what the deal is, right? Yes. Like we're there to bust each other. I remember a long time ago, uh, me and a friend of mine, very close friends, were at the same table. It was a tournament. The players were getting down. It was maybe 50 or 60 left out of like a thousand one of those thousand five hundred dollar buy in fields, and we talked about it. You know, we're just like, look, just play hard. Like, let's try to bust each other and see what happens, right? And he slow played aces and took like seventy <laughs> percent of my stack like straight away. And I was like, okay, like I actually, you know, it's I, I don't know, it's we're professionals and you, you guys are professionals, so you're going to be pros, right? Exactly. You're gonna, treat each other just like you would any other human being that you you battle against. Yeah, absolutely. What have been your biggest fears and obstacles that have stood in your path to greatness? I think being afraid of doing something because it looks bad. I think, yeah, especially even a few years ago when, you know, there's more content about poker out and uh, focus on like PO and all this stuff that there's definitely been moments when I get in my own head and say call in a spot where everything in my body is saying folds. But I know that like, if I told this hand history to, you know, this person, that person, they would say, call, I can't fold this hand. And 
not kind of trusting myself. It's just, it's such a huge obstacle. I see so many people stuck in this mindset these days. Um, And I mean, in a way, I don't want to point it out because I think that's kind of where my edge over other regs lies because, you know, they're not willing to call me down with, with the wrong combo or, you know, things like that. It's interesting because I, so I've had many discussions about uh, like the quote unquote field players versus the quote unquote analytical players and an episode that hasn't gone live yet interviewed my friend Adam Creek. He was telling me about the Myers Briggs test. Um, He's not a poker player. He's an Olympian um, high performance coach type of human. And he was telling me about Myers Briggs and he was saying that like on one end of the spectrum, you have analytics and this player at at the extreme end is like close to autism, right? Where they just, yeah, they, they do not um, understand emotions and interactions with humans. And then on this side, you have the intuitive people who are like the quote unquote feel players who really can't describe why they feel the way they do. They just feel it. And he said, if you get into an argument logically on the internet about who's right and who's wrong, the analytical person will win a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But that doesn't discount the fact that the intuitive side does exist. And that these players are playing at a high level. And sometimes intuitively you think I just have to fold and that's okay. Right? Like you don't Mm -hmm. have to explain yourself to anybody and maybe you can't even reverse engineer or explain it yourself why you feel that way. You just do. Yeah. I mean, when I go back to when I first learned poker, I did well right away. And one thing that, you know, when you're first learning, they always say like, pay attention and try to guess people's cards right? Like even if you're not in the hand, try to guess what people have. It's a good way to learn the game. And, uh, you know, I'm certainly not arrogant in poker, but that's one thing that I feel very good at. And I don't know how to always say why I think they have this hand and I might be better now than I used to be. But how does it work in your head? Like when you're ranging people, like, Mm -hmm. can you describe that process? I think, I mean, it's, it's, can be quite complicated. And there's probably so many subconscious things happening that we don't know, especially live poker, right? Like maybe for whatever reason that, you know, you, someone's eating and then they raise. And for some reason you can tell that they think it's going to look strong or it actually legitimately is. And there's differences and subtle differences that like I can see that I, it's hard to describe. But um, I think for the most part, you know, if I'm on the river and I'm trying to put someone on a range, it's what did they do pre-flop? What did they do on the flop? What did they do on the turn? And kind of just going with all the information that I have. And well, I think like I'll give an example of like sure. how yeah. it works in my mind. Yeah. In my mind, it kind of works like guess who, where like I kind of see the grid and I'm like checking, marking off all the little combos on the grid yep. on the river. I was just curious as to like how it, visually how you yes. think about the ranges. Yeah. So I think, I think something like that. And then, you know, there's all sorts of information coming, like there's, you know, what was their sizing on the flop? And, you know, if this player is this player that I've put in box a, do they ever use the size as a bluff? No, probably not. Okay. Now let's go over here. So now his range is more narrow. And then, you know, what did he do on the turn? And then, you know, all of this sort of information that you're give you're given. And I think that sometimes when people are t- you know, too analytical and not understanding that, you know, player A never does this and they're making assumptions that are incorrect to, to this box. Right. And, you know, if you pay attention and understand that there's tendencies for different players and it's really important to differentiate who's doing what. It's, you know, it's a thing that creates an edge in poker when you have people who are trying to implement like a Pio strategy or something like that yeah. in a spot where dude is just never bluffing, like dude never, dude never has value yes. or dude is never bluffing if you're paying attention. Yeah. And like the, the biggest mistake that I see people make, like I'll see somebody run a SIM and it's in the inputs, right? It's oh, like it's your, in, your inputs are horrible. Like your, the assumptions so you're hard. making are yeah. so bad. Like, uh, so of course the answer you get is going to be awful. Yeah. Like, yeah, you can say never. You can say, okay, I'm never folding kings preflop ever, right? Well, if you go on Pio and you put the range as aces, it'll tell you to fold. Exactly. Right? Like exactly. <laughs> and sometimes in live poker, we know that the range is just aces. It just you know? is. Yeah, yeah, it just is. And I think that you know, unless you're playing like those hundred Ks with the toughest people, or the you know the twenty five Ks with the toughest 
components, like the variables change dramatically and we're given tons of information. And I think it's, it's absolutely ridiculous to not use that information. You know, if I'm in a 5k main event or a 10k main event or something, there's so much information and, and going towards, you know, the spectrum of players like instinctual versus analytical, I can tell you, like, I've literally had the experience and I know Alex has said this as well. It's like some days you actually feel like you're in people's heads. Like, it's, I don't even know what that is or how to describe it, but I know that, you know, good poker players have this. It's like a state of flow. Yeah. And it's, it's just this ability state. to like, I, like you literally just like, oh, they have this hand and then they have that hand. It's like, whoa, this is crazy, but it happens a lot. And I don't, I don't think we're crazy in thinking that it happens a lot. I think that there is some talent there. I don't know if there's a big part of it that's natural, if it's learned, but I think it's, it's really like that's kind of the part of poker that I think is so cool and what I hate so much about this direction that poker's going in being overly analytical because there is this element that that I hope will always stay a little bit. I, I think it's I remember when somebody was explaining, like I never bought into Pio right from the get-go. Something fell off to me about Pio. I know like Nick Howard had a lot of problems with it. Uh, he suffered a lot with Pio, but like when somebody tells me like oh, this is a strategy that is resistant no matter what action your opponent takes. I would think, why would I do that? Like, and if somebody's using it against me, then what does it matter? If yeah. everything that I do is exactly the same, like, then it makes no difference what I'm doing. It's like yeah. taking, taking the, your opponent completely out of the equation, which yep. is like a really dumb thing to try to attempt in poker when it's all about your opponent. Yep. As soon as I, there was a point when I was playing cash games, I wanted to improve my win rate, reached out to a coach who was obsessed with like, at that point we were just saying balance, right? You want to be balanced here. You want to be balanced here. So all of a sudden, instead of, you know, I guess I was exploitively probably making large bets with my good hands or, you know, things like that. I was then, you know, maybe well, I have to bet the same with my good hands and bad hands. But it's like, wait, but this guy's told me he has like the second nuts and I have the nuts and he's not going to fold. So I should just shove. Like, I don't need to bet 55% here because I would do that with a bluff. Things like that. And my win rate, honestly, just like went in the tank. Like I, I did so bad when I started playing from that kind of perspective. Oh my God. I, tr I tried it too, right? It's like, oh, I, I don't think this guy's ever folding, but I do need to have bluffs here. I don't oh, want to just always be value betting, right? So then I would bluff and like get snapped. And I like, I wonder how much money that has cost me over the years just thinking I need to have bluffs, but he's never folding, but I need to be balanced. Exactly. Okay, I'll throw it, a 75% pot size yeah. bet. Then they snap it off and I just feel like an idiot. Yep. Exactly. And I think that's, that's one of what we were saying. The obstacles is that I experience of getting out of all of that sort of knowledge that I learn coming from a good place, but maybe isn't very practical. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, yeah. you got to do you, right? And yeah. like exploitative play in poker is everything. And it, it's so agree. What everybody should, I love that. Every, what everybody should aspire to do. And, you know, I've said it many times on this show that like, even if you look in Pio, like exploitative play is just having more information against your opponent and like using it to take advantage of their deficiencies. I mean, yes. this is how you maximize win rate. But I mean, I'm grateful for the, uh, you know, the quote unquote pile revolution because it just means poker's going to be good for a while. I know. Funnily enough, it's true. <laughs> what does your process look like for regularly improving your game? I think I come from a background of kind of believing that putting in hours really does a lot. Um, I think that if you're playing and you're playing in a way where you're analyzing what's happening and you're actively learning while playing, I, I, I believe in that a lot. I think, as we kind of said, I, it sounds like we're on the same page with um, PO and all that stuff. I think, I think if I was to try to do that, I would be wasting a lot of time. I love talking hand histories with people. I think that I learn a lot that way. I think, yeah, speaking with people who can help you think about spots in a better way and kind of put logic like, wait, why do we want to bet this size on this board? Oh, well, wait a second. We don't have very many bluffs. Maybe we don't need to bet big here. We can, you know, things like that. I love discussions like that. Yeah. So I think, I think just playing and talking to friends, seeing what they're doing, like success leaves clues, right? So watching 
the players who are better than me and trying to learn what they're doing that works and what they're doing that doesn't. I think one thing I just have to say is, you know, in poker, we can never really think that we know everything. You can always get better and you have to always get better. Right. And it, it's, a, it's the dance, you know, it's a line that we have to walk to be assertive, reassured enough to pull the trigger and make decisions that we genuinely in our heart believe in and even defend decisions that we make that maybe our friends criticize yeah. or somebody criticizes, but also be open to the fact that, yeah, we could have, we could have messed it up. We could have done better. You know, you, everything, every argument that we make, I think in poker for a decision has to be defended. Yeah. Defendable by us. And like, as long as you can defend it, then okay, you move on. But like, you can't just get in this mode of hubris where you think you know everything and you're not receptive and everybody's wrong. Yeah. Because like, this is obviously something that happens. And like, you know, I'm, I'm sure when I was much younger, I was uh, <laughs> one of the, probably one of the prime people that was like, no, you're an idiot. I'm right. Yes. You're wrong. Yeah. And, and, and- that's what we'll see in the players who, you know, now who have been playing for 20 years or 30 years. And if they're too stubborn to, you know, make changes to their game and adapt their mindset towards certain spots, then, you know, unfortunately, they're just not going to beat the games anymore. So nope. they're done. And you can see this. You can actually see this play out. If you play a lot of live poker, you see the guys who are 60 years old that used to play cash games and used to crush cash games. And then just one year they woke up, went to the casino and they weren't able to beat poker by just playing super nitty and getting paid off all the time. And they, they, they didn't adapt. They didn't learn. And this is going to continue on in the future for the folks that, you know, played five years ago and exactly. have some level of success. You don't keep working five years down the road. Exactly. You may be that guy. Exactly. And, you know, they're the guy sitting and criticizing me for three betting them with five, six suited. And then I just stacked their aces. And it's like, well, why don't you see what I did in that hand that worked? And what was so good about that? And why don't you try putting some old knit with aces in a tough spot in that same spot and stack him? It's like, yeah. So I I just call that active learning. I don't know exactly how we would put it, but. That's a a good phrase. Yes. It's funny that you know, like you said, you watch players that are better than you. You try to reverse engineer what they're thinking through each action that they make. And like this information is there, right? Like yep. if you're at a low, lower skill level and somebody at a higher skill level crushes you in a pot where you have no idea what they did, yep. it's an opportunity to reverse engineer what they did and learn and not get mad and assume they made a mistake. Yes, exactly. And even, you know, if I'm in a hand online and someone does something really creative versus me, I make sure I I notice that and then maybe incorporate that into my game. I'm like, oh, wow, he just bet one big blind on the turn to check back the river. And I literally like get no value off this hand. Like, you know, I need to think about that spot of how can I, you know, then exploit him trying to exploit me next time. And then how can I put this into my game to do that to other players? Because that worked really well. (laughs) Like, You know, it's just another um, weapon in your arsenal. Exactly. So I, I think that for me, that's that's what I strongly believe in. If you could gift all poker players one book to read, what would that book be and why? One of the f- my favorite books that not only kind of inspired me with poker and just life in general, it's uh, The Power of Full Engagement um, by Jim Lohr and Tony Schwartz. I found it just to be a really good book book about mindset and I guess I think being tough in life which is really important in poker um giving it your all which again is is important in poker and not just show what do you mean by being tough I think um you know show you know let's say take the world series of poker um you show up every day the fields are so big you probably have no success (laughs) that's that's most people's summer right and I mean, just continuing to show up, being positive, focusing on the things that are important or that you have control of instead of just complaining about bad beats or things like that. You know, I've never experienced this, but some people have bad sessions and they want to leave. Things like playing through those hard times and, you know, whatever it is that you're struggling, poker brings out challenges in everybody and they're always different for everybody, I think. You know, some people fall into categories. Again, you know, I hate booking losing sessions. So I become, you know, I have the tendency to play when I'm tired and, you know, sacrifice my win rate, things like that. 
it's funny you say that. I, I have a I have this theory that I I I had this maybe a month ago where I was playing a session and like I'm I'm I I'm a high intensity player. So a thousand hands a day of cash game and I feel that's it, like that's my goal every day. A thousand hands, four okay. tabling. If I get stuck right away, like say I lose four or five buy-ins, like I can rip through that thousand in like four hours and feel fine. Like I'm not on yeah. tilt. Oh, great. Okay. I just have like adrenaline. It's like yes. I, I notice this extra adrenaline and this extra energy drive that's, that's yeah. not normally there, right? And like it's counterintuitive to every poker book, everything that you read about playing when you're stuck. But I just had this, and, and I would feel bad about it, right? For mm-hmm. a, like a, most of my career, I would feel bad about using this energy, and then I just realized, like, why am I feeling bad about this? Like this Embrace is like a, this is a gift, right? Like this it is. is I know I'm not tilting. I'm not angry. I just have this adrenaline that's giving me this competitive ex- drive. Extra long session. That's awesome. Yeah. Whatever your challenge is, like facing it and, um, you know, being able to, you know, not everybody in poker, but you like we said, the ups and downs, the ups and downs. It's how you handle the downs that get you back up quicker, you know, and like get through it quick. Don't, don't dwell it out and don't make it worse. And you never know what you're, you can never find your limit unless you go through the suffering that gets you there, right? If you're always, av- if, if you're a- averse to the pain and the struggle and you walk away and you quit, yeah. you never push yourself. You never find your limit, which to me is doing yourself a disservice, right? Like Absolutely. Because we're all capable of more than we think we're capable of. And so yeah. it's a matter of pushing ourselves, finding that limit. And there's nothing more fulfilling than going out of your comfort zone and maybe succeeding, maybe not, but there's something fulfilled that at least for me, um, I think that that's kind of what life is about, right? Trying to progress and growth. Yeah, exactly. I love, that's what I love about poker the most. I think, you know, it's yeah. The ability to see, (laughs) yeah. The ability to see growth. I I always felt like it's crazy that some people go to work and they show up. It doesn't matter how you do. You know, you can be a barista at Starbucks. You can be a really nice, great one, or you can be like, you know, kind of a shitty person to people and and not do a very good job. And you make the exact same amount of money. And that always bothered me. Of like, how how is that possible? You know, my parents own a business, and I would hear them maybe like complain about people, or some people are so good, and it's like, shouldn't people get rewarded for doing a good job, like, and get paid more? Um, And I really loved that with poker, I I truly believed and still believe that, you know, if you're working hard in poker and working smart at poker, um, unfortunately, there's all those people, like we just said, the misguided people who think they're studying a lot and that's going to get them to success. And it's not. And I hate, you know, I hate saying that, but I I don't think it is. It's Um, definitely not. No. And, but there's such this false belief of it. It's, it's like mind blowing. It's dogmatic. I mean, yeah. The people who, who tell me like, you need to be studying 50% to what you play. And it's like, well, I'm having like success enough how I am. And this has been like 12 years. I think I'm okay. Um, you know, maybe, and then I'm sitting there thinking you need to play more and get some volume. And, and, you know, it's one thing to think, you know, about, you know, how to handle a certain spot, but I don't know, having the experience to do it and performing in the moment is a whole different skill set. It's an interesting thing that I can say I have probably studied much less than most people, like in a conventional way of studying. Now, early on, when it, like if it's discussing hand histories with friends, like yeah. I never even considered that studying, right? Like that's just exactly. fun. This is like yes. what I, this is what I want to do. This is what like lights me up, right? Yeah. So like I, I love that, but like just doing deep dive database, diving yeah. into Pio. I have used Pio. Like I, I've ran some Sims and looked at it. Yeah. It's just not really, you know, just playing and learning and thinking deeply about spots that confuse me. And that, that's like a thing. If I get confused and I, or I'm uncertain, like yep. I'll carry that with me and I'll think about it before I go to bed at night and then try to figure out some sort of solution on how to get better um, yeah. the next day. I'm like, totally with you. <laughs> there's just pride in in doing your best, I, I, which is a weird thing. Like I don't know why it just popped into my head, but like even when I worked at Applebee's, I I still wanted to be the best server that I could be. Like I I don't know what like maybe it's just something in me. When I was a cashier 
at a grocery store. Yeah. Like I wanted to scan everybody's items faster than everybody else. Like, I don't know. I just I, always wanted to be the best. That I absolutely. I, I say this all the time. I say, if I was a barista at Starbucks, I'd be the best one. I, I had a job where I was a hostess and I remember I had to clean the bathrooms and I was always like, the bathrooms were the cleanest. Like, why would you want to do anything half-ass, you know, and not give it your all? Yeah. yeah. I don't I'd be uh, curious to know if that's just like something some people are born with or maybe or your like, parents installed. No, for, no, <laughs> no. Oh, that's no, interesting. No chance. Okay. No. I, I think I don't, maybe from like a competitive, competitive sports, like as a kid playing baseball growing up and playing all stars, traveling around, I know that there was a lot of, uh, I think like as weird as it sounds, like as a 10 or 11 year old, like this was kind of my identity, right? Like I was a ball player and I was great. And my whole family, like thinking back on it now is kind of odd, but like my mom and dad were divorced and like both entire sides of the family would come to like every single one of my games, which is like 30, 30 people. Wow. And so I I remember just feeling really good about that. And maybe that has some sort of impact on down the line. uh. I really have no idea. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, if you could wave a magic wand, change one thing about poker, what would it be? I think I'm just going to go with this one because it was something I was talking about earlier today and it's on my mind is that people are so critical of each other and there's like these sort of cliques and nasty environment or this urge that some players have to say to another, like to say that someone else sucks, like, like, Oh, you know, Stevie Chidwick, I just saw him on this final table and he did this and he sucks. Oh wait, but wait a second. He's like, you know, been the number one player in the world forever. And this kind of attitude of, of that, of like wanting other people to suck and like just poor sportsmanship. I I hate that. It's ego. Yes. It's ego. And for the most part, it's just jealousy. Yes, yes. And I, I, I really hate that. I, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. What's funny is like, I didn't realize this was a thing in poker because forever playing cash games, I didn't really see that very much in the cash game world. And then also playing online, like on an anonymous site before I got on Twitter, because I had to get on Twitter to promote my podcast and like reach out to people. Yeah. When I got on Twitter, that was when I realized like, oh, people are kind of nasty in the poker world. Like, Yeah. <laughs> and unfortunately, especially in the tournament world, you know, there's the element of luck, obviously, in tournaments is quite high. Um, and then people see people get, you know, big scores. And um, it seems like there's a lot of jealousy and all these negative feelings, especially around tournament poker, because it's like, oh, wait a second, I've been grinding tournaments for years and years. And this person comes and binks this and binks that. And, you know, unfortunately, even with what I think about, um, you know, we talked earlier about the situation with me and Alex, I think a lot of that even could stem from you know, a lot of people hating that because there's a, an a aspect of jealousy around that a little bit, you know? Um, it's just a, it's like a scarcity mindset versus an abundance mindset. Like yeah. in, in my mind, it's like, okay, so we're in this quarantine situation, like 20 new poker podcasts could pop up because nobody has anything to do with their lives right now. But for me, it's like, if that happens, if like Doyle starts a podcast, all this does is grow the market for podcasts and more people can potentially find mine, right? Like yep. you always want to have an abundant mindset where like, yeah, your friends do well. Why be jealous of them? Like exactly. this is this is good for both of you down the road. Yes. If you go broke, now your friend has money and can invest in you. So like you should be cheering them on. You should be genuinely happy for all these human beings that are having success. Just exactly. because, yeah, it's... Yeah. And just having respect for your competitors as well. You know, if there's, if there's a player who's showing up and maybe he's not the best player, like we, you don't need to, you're not above him as a person. Like that's one thing I think I've always, you know, I grew up learning, like just because I might have more money than someone, I'm not better than them as a human being. And like, what makes you better is being nice, you know, versus being like, Oh, I'm better. I'm better at poker than you. And that makes me a better person. And you know, I, there's so much of that that exists. It's because people have their whole identity wrapped up in their skill level in poker. Yep. Um, it's pretty rare to for high stakes players to go after people like that. I think it, it's more prevalent in like the lower the lower stakes, getting pissed at people for playing poorly or whatever. But like, yeah, I just I've always had this like 
thought in my head that like I'm the I'm the person who's lowest on the totem pole here. Like I'm I'm a poker player. I'm playing against somebody with discretionary income that can drop 10k and not bat an eye. Like that's the person I want to be. Like I aspire to be them. Absolutely. Not, not me. Yeah, grinding it out and yeah. Right. But yeah, just because you're better at a game than somebody else doesn't mean very much. Yeah. Right? Other than you're likely to make money <laughs> playing exactly. said game. Exactly. Exactly. If you could erect a billboard that every poker player has got to drive past on the way to the casino, what does it say? No one wants to hear your bad beat stories. <laughs> I think that that's probably the, the more and more I play poker, the less I care about hearing bad beat stories. It's just like, oh, it's so frustrating. And what we were talking about, about you know growing as a poker player, it's such a huge setback if you're going to view the game that way. Right. And, and yeah. like, it's funny because Sean Snyder's been sharing a bunch of mixed game hands on Twitter. I've been reading them every night. I love most of them. And then one of them was like yesterday, and I know he's making a joke, but he's like, my, biggest, my worst day of online poker, I lost 100 bets and 10 buy-ins, had aces versus, had kings versus aces five times. And like immediately I could just feel me on the inside go like, no, I don't want to finish reading this. <laughs> like, yes. I, don't, I don't care. I just felt like kind of gross about yep. like a bad beat. And don't get me wrong. Like sometimes, you know, you take a bad beat, but it's interesting and it's worth exploring and it's worth talking about it because there's learning that can happen from yeah. that beat. But yeah. like, but it's just like, oh, I got in aces and they had the Kings and they flopped the King. It's like, okay. Like, yeah. And that's the one thing, like, you know, the people who are transitioning from recreational to pro or like even some pros, like don't get your head wrapped up in those huge pots. Like even when there's some people I kind of like coach and say something like, oh, you know, like I went deep in this, but this hand happened or like, how should I have played this hand? I'm like, don't worry about the big pots. Like all of these hands, like the Queens versus Ace King and all this kind of stuff, it plays itself in poker and you're not going to like ever make a huge error. Like don't waste your energy here. Like it's the other pots. It's all the small stuff. Yeah. I, for some reason, I've always just framed it in my head as like, I get Kings versus Aces and I will get Aces versus Kings. And like it, yeah. it, it all evens out in the long run. So there's no use spending any energy in, in yeah. thinking about it. Yeah. Um, I did have something to say, but by the way, this is like forever ago in the conversation, but you were talking about when you asked for money in Supernova Elite. And I, I had the thought that like, I think it's hard for people to be vulnerable especially in poker because you feel like there's so much judgment. Yeah. Everybody will judge you for going broke or for not being able to afford to, like you said, play in the 10 Ks, but like vulnerability, that space of being vulnerable is actually, it's the strongest position you can be in because you don't have to worry about anybody finding anything out about you. You don't have to hide anything. You know, you're just able to be open and this is yeah. your situation. And like, I think that, you actually, you know, busting, getting close to busting your account was like such a huge boon to your career. Because if you're not forced into that situation, you're probably not going to ever do it, right? Yeah. Well, let's be honest here. Like I could have, there was definitely a part of me that was like, okay, I'm going to give up. Like I'm not going to do this anymore. Maybe poker isn't for me. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm not good enough and all of that stuff. And as you were saying with the people who are good at poker and tying their identity, I mean, to some extent, if if you're taking poker like I was, and it sounds like you were, that it's it's almost like your life. Like I was eat, sleep, breathe poker, that there is like, you know, it is a big part of my identity. So for me to then, you know, admit that I failed or that that things are going wrong, it's hard to do. And it's, you know, it doesn't feel nice. Um, it, you do have to be vulnerable to be like, oh, well, maybe it's okay that I failed this moment and somebody sees that, you know, I have talent or that I'm good enough to work out of it. But yeah, there was definitely, you know, all of those doubts in my head of like, maybe I am crazy doing this. And like you said, that people laughed in your face that you're going to be a professional poker player. And it's like, you know, typically I, I tended to always like laugh in their face back. Like I I'm going to do it. Prove me. Me too. But you yeah. yeah. But you have those moments where you're like, damn, maybe, maybe they're right. <laughs> I did not want to go. Like I did not want to fail, especially early on and go back home with like my tail between my legs. That was felt like not an option. And yeah. looking, looking back at what I did in the beginning, I think like, God, 
I would never suggest anybody ever attempt that because like the failure rate is close to a hundred percent. Yeah. I, I don't know how I made it out alive. Yeah. Uh, just, I guess, naturally have a higher skill level than the competition at the time in 2004, yeah. which live limit poker is not saying very much sure. uh, back in the day. <laughs> but um, sure. yeah, I mean, you, nobody wants to be a failure, but like, I, I think even your situation about selling action in 10 Ks, right? It's like, if you really think about it, everything that you have in your life, everything I have in my life is all directly, has all directly come from poker. This computer that I'm talking to you on right now comes from me playing poker, right? Like, yeah, it's amazing. So if you like, you, you can, you can even go broke right now and still have all of these amazing things that have come from poker. And it doesn't mean you're a bad poker player, right? Yeah. Like, some people are just really horrible with money. Absolutely. That's, that's just a separate thing entirely. In common, yeah. But it, it's true that you have to be vulnerable. I mean, even now, like, you know, there's some 25 case coming up and I need to sell action. And there's a part of me that like hates doing it. And I guess, you know, th- I definitely know that there's some people who are going to say no. And it kind of hurts in a, in a way, you know, you're like, oh my God, like I, you know. Well, they don't believe in me. Yes, exactly. And yeah, you just have to be vulnerable to even just take that and accept that's okay. It is what it is and and use it to motivate me for the future. Right. To, yeah. It, you're going to get told no a lot in life. And yep. that's just, if you're afraid of being told no, then you're never going to get told yes. Exactly. Exactly. What's your current big goal as related to poker? I would say to, there's, I guess not that I have like a distinct goal, but I have many goals within that. I would, I'll just name a few, I guess. Um, I think that, you know, the plan for me for the next, you know, few years was definitely play as much live as I can um, in events that I like and uh, have success there. I, I guess I, I would love to be, you know, I want to be successful in general overall, but it would be a cool thing to like uh, get the, the female, like most successful female, like on money earnings. So you're not there yet. No, Vanessa Vanessa Selps has like tons. (laughs) She had a, it felt like her poker career was kind of short, but maybe it was, I don't know. No. So I met Vanessa on party poker back in like 2004. Wow. Um, (laughs) We played weird. It's funny how like things were so different back then. We were playing against each other, like five, 10, three handed. And we just like, were typing in the chat and shared AIM information, uh, wow. AOL Instant Messenger. And like, so she's been, she was, she was around for like, I think 11 years. I think she quit in 2005, but it could have been a little later than that. Okay. I'm not exactly sure. I just saw her recently at one of the WPTs. But anyways, I would love to take her spot over of that. How far just, away are you? Uh, I, I feel like she's at like 11 and I'm at 5 million or something like that. Uh, that's a big gap. Yeah, it is. So that's why I need those those 25K final tables to go good. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, that's not... It feels like kind of a silly goal to me at the same time. But I think that to some extent, it would be cool to leave some sort of legacy in that way. And I think that I am definitely driven to play live poker and play in these events to if there's any chance that it opens the path of like another female feeling like poker is a possibility for her or, or, you know, also proving that women can compete at a level that's, you know, the same as men and, you know, can, can do well at the highest levels. I, I just really aspire to change that mentality because it's something that, you know, I, I never really complain about like, sexist things in in poker in general really because i do believe strongly that you know men are men and women are women and some of the stuff that women complain about i think is like kind of silly like if some guy calls me pretty like i'm just gonna say thank you Uh, i'm happy for a compliment i'm not gonna be like oh my god i'm playing poker and you said i'm pretty like that you know i like come on like that's being a little sensitive i think and that doesn't need to be something to be upset about but what does upset me is you know, if I sit down and it's just assumed that, you know, I'm a female and we're, we're less than, we're stupid, you know, can't be good at poker. I understand that, you know, poker definitely attracts more men than women, but that doesn't mean that, you know, there can't be a certain percentage of women that happen to be quite good at poker. And I just think that, you know, if, 
it is, it is a motivation for me to play in these live games and have that kind of exposure because I think that it is important for someone to do that and pave the path. Like even for myself, you know, seeing when I first started watching poker on TV and Jennifer Harmon was on, she was someone who kind of inspired me. Like, I feel like I kind of relate to her in a little, in a way that, you know, she's, you know, not an intimidating person to look at and, you know, kind of like this sweet girl, but like can play poker. And, um, you know, even Vanessa Selps, like seeing her battle out there is inspiring. And yeah, I think it would kind of give my poker career some purpose as well, you know, to think that, I don't know, that if I'm helping to open that door a little bit, I think that that's the way that I see myself doing that is just by having the success and, um, uh, yeah, showing that someone can do that. So I would love to just like do really well in the high roller events. Um, if I, if I was out there to just make money, I would just play cash games and have an easy life. But I think that to me, that challenge is, is one I want to take on. Yeah. And we, we need emotional goals. Emotional goals drive us. Yes. Goals for money don't really drive us. They don't motivate us. Yeah, absolutely. What would you say to, you know, imagine there's a 19 year old version of yourself um, who's about to enter the poker world, phenom coming up. What wisdom would you share with that human? I think I would say um, calm down. You, their poker is still going to be there in 10 years. We don't need to play like 40 hour sessions. <laughs> um, and so, yes, I think that I, there was probably some periods where I was too focused on poker and should have like, you know, I would feel so anxious to play when I woke up that I couldn't even like calm myself to go to the gym. And even though that's something very important to me. So it was like, I was just so, so anxious to play. I don't know how to explain it. And I think just understanding You're like... obsessed. You, you I was, yeah, I was obsessed. And it was like, book a loss sometimes. It's okay. And yeah, just believe in yourself and make sure to surround myself with positive people. Because for some parts of, of poker, I've been around people who weren't necessarily as supportive. And I can tell you that when my poker career results went really high, it was when the people around me were you know, helping me just like, you know, the emotional support from people who are behind you is like so invaluable versus somebody who, you know, might be, even if they're not attempting to hold you back. Yeah. You're the average of the five people you spend the most time with and genuinely believe that if you spend time, you know, there are people who are amazing at poker who are very bad to be around. Like you do not want to spend tons of time around them. And like, you just have to be very picky when it comes to that very close network of people you surround yourself with. Absolutely. I actually, I don't know if it was your, no, it was, um, I was listening to, I think it was Jennifer Shahad, Shahadi, I don't know how you say her last name. And she was saying that there was a study that if you tell someone, I'm, I'm not going to say it correctly, something along the lines of if you tell somebody, especially women, like, oh, women aren't good at poker or women aren't good at chess, right before they go perform, their performance is less than if you, you know, you're giving them like positive reinforcement. And I know for myself, that's huge. Like I've been in spots on final tables where people would question a play I made during a final table. And I'm like, don't do that again. Like, because then all of a sudden I'm like, out of my flow state and I'm questioning myself and I'm not having confidence in my decisions. And so if you have someone who's, you know, some people are better at taking criticism than others, but for me, I need, I need like the, I need some criticism, but I need some positivity along with it. I don't like when people are just like, this is bad. And you see that a lot in poker. You say a hand to a person and they're like, that's bad. And it's like, why? It's like, it's just bad. (laughs) It's like, okay, can you, you know? Yeah, this has been. This is why I've never been compelled to like go to two plus two and jump on the oh. forums and post stuff because, like, I guess I, I just I'm a questioner, right? Like, I question yes. everything. And when somebody's like, "Oh no, that's fine. That's standard," I'm like, "Why is that standard? That's not good enough for me." Like my yeah. my expectations for a thing are so much higher than standard. Like, let's actually go deep and try to play above the rim here instead of just being like average, right? Exactly. And plus, the feedback that that I've read, like back in the day, it used to be great. 
like Vanessa was on there. Tom Dwan was on there posting hands. Like so just cool. all, all these crushers are all on like in high six, no limit, giving feedback on hands and stuff. And like, then it's a very valuable asset. But like nowadays, I, I do not think no. message boards are really, I think they do more harm than good. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you have any projects you're working on that are near and dear to your heart? Um, well, beyond just grinding poker, I think um, on a personal level, I definitely am always working really hard kind of like on fitness stuff. But um, I did start a blog on party poker that would be like a weekly segment focusing on health and lifestyle things. So actually, it's just like my second week coming up tomorrow. Um, So I'm just probably my favorite topics to talk about are poker and then like nutrition, lifestyle, anything to kind of improve yourself. And so I'm kind of doing a, um, I think it's called like Kristen's Corner on um, the Party Poker blog and Twitter, uh, trying to focus on, I guess, sharing information that I've gathered throughout the years. And at the same time, continuing to like research, research all those things. Because I noticed that that's what I was doing. You know, I was playing poker for 12 hours a day and then listening to Joe Rogan podcasts about, you know, this, that, and everything. And um, yeah. It's always been silly to me that the easiest thing to like improve your cognitive ability is going to be like food, your nutrition, and your fitness. And like, it's something that can improve that makes you money without even having to think about poker. And like, why do people put it on the back burner? Oh, it's crazy. It just changes your life. You know, I, I actually, at one point when I was started doing okay at poker, I went and got a personal trainer and I probably spent like 30% of my, my, the cash that I had on this personal trainer or something, but it changed my life. Like it, just in so many ways. And yeah. I, yeah. I, I spoke, so Dara came on my podcast, we talked and he, he was like a marathoner and he was saying that he had like, uh, his secret weapon was like deep in tournaments. He felt clearer than everybody else. He felt like he had more energy and I'm like, well, yeah, like you're a marathoner, right? Like you've built your body to be able to focus for 10 hours straight. Whereas somebody who doesn't in like the most, the hot, highest value spots of the tournament deep when you need your brain to be functioning at a high level. Yep. There's fails them because they haven't put in that time. And it's like, even like going to lift weights or doing a tough workout. I feel like that challenge that you give your body and your mind in those moments really does translate to poker, you know, in those sessions that you might not feel good or what, like in so many ways, but it, you just strengthen yourself and, you know, not only on a physical standpoint, you know, getting through those last reps that burn and understanding like pain is just kind of like, it's, it's almost fake in a way. It you is know? your, your brain lies to you. And like, yes. as, as like, I think about, I'm try, I try to be aware of things that are happening. Uh, you know, try meditation, just try to be aware of like my emotions, what my mind is telling me. And like, I realize when I'm, you know, 30 minutes into a, uh, a workout, my brain's telling me like, you've done enough. Like, you know, you could go home, like your, your body's tired, but then I can still go the other 30 minutes. My body makes it through. And like, yes. I just, I've had to learn like, oh, your brain is lying to you. Yes. Like, you, you never find your limit unless you just say brain, you're a fucking liar. Like my body's fine. Like you don't feel like going to the gym. When I go to the gym, my body's fine. So it's yes. my, my brain that's lying to me. So like overcoming that, it's just a huge op- obstacle that can, you know, be monumental to your success. Absolutely. And the way you feel once you did go past that, you know, it's, it's again, what you were saying, like going out of your comfort zone in poker and in life in general, it's, yeah. that's where growth happens. And that's where I think like real fulfillment as well. I agree. Yeah. I, I, but again, we're the people that want to be like the best baristas in the world. Yes. <laughs> I will be. If I ever have to work at Starbucks, I swear I'm going to be the best producer. So I got two more questions. Okay. Um, in 15 years, what are your accomplishments going to be in the poker world? Okay. In let's hope uh, I win the main event once. That would be fun. That's kind of a silly one because I think that's pretty hard to achieve. But I think what I was saying before about the Vanessa Seltz 
beating her on the all-time money list would be cool. Yeah, winning, well, hopefully winning like multiple, multiple like high roller events, maybe some main events in there. I would love to win a main event that's like a big one. I haven't yet. It's definitely feels like something I'd like to achieve. I think just hopefully still being around in poker. I can't imagine I won't be unless, you know, the world changes drastically. But um you're you right now you're you're kind of within striking distance of I see the man back there in the corner. Yeah. Grinding his session out. Uh your <laughs> boyfriend Alex Foxen, you're you're number five in the GPI. Like you you could legit go on a go on a tear and get yeah. there, right? Oh, I would love to be number one. That's actually a good a good achievement. Yes, I would yeah. like to beat him out of that <laughs> number one spot. Well, that you, would be a pretty cool achievement. You're right there. I like your chances of that way way more than winning the main event. <laughs> yes, thank you. And I would actually take that over the main event too. You should. I think for sure. Poker players like that's that should be the aim, right? Consistency. Yes. Yeah. Over a long period of time. I've always said I don't want to win the lottery. I want to work hard and like, you know, do well, but you don't want it all in one thing. I, I've, said, I've, n- I've never I've wanted to win the lottery. Yeah, yeah. Me neither. Like I, I want to work hard and because like that's the fruit of the labor, right? That's where the yes. fulfillment, the sense of accomplishment comes yeah. from earning it. Yeah. And I love the, pro- I like, I, like I love the process. I love the hard work. I love, you know, I'm in the sauna and it's like really, really challenging to stay in. I love that feeling. I love the feeling of working through a workout and even of poker. It's just, yeah, it's what's so cool about it. And I think that mindset is probably one of the things that have, have made you great in the hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Kristen has been awesome. Final question. Where okay. can the Chasing Poker Greatness audience find you? Mostly on Twitter, I would say, is where I'm most active on social media. Um, I do have, I guess, an Instagram page as well. But yeah, follow me on Twitter. And I have a Party Poker blog that's that I'll be posting more regularly. And I'm very open to any feedback or any topics that one, anybody wants to discuss. They can just tweet at me and let me know. I'd really appreciate that, actually. Because I, you know, as you might know, it's... I'm open to putting content out there, but I'm not really sure what people want. So it would be interesting to hear, you know, what people want to see if anyone would be so kind to share that with me. And uh, yeah, I'm always playing online on party poker these days so they can follow me there. I'm Chrissy B 24. Nice tweet at Kristen. Let her know what you want her to create. Please. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time and your energy. I'm very grateful. Let's do this again. When you knock off Alex at number one, uh, awesome <laughs> within deal. the next year I'm uh, in thanks for having me on it was a nice conversation my pleasure thank you so much for listening to this episode of Chasing Poker Greatness if you have yet to subscribe to the show please take a second to do so on Apple Podcasts or wherever your favorite place to listen to podcasts may be for more content from me Coach Brad please visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash enhance your edge and I'll see you next time